Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves going again. We are gonna shift our attention from working with simple vectors. And vectors are kind of okay for doing some preliminary calcs and doing things very quickly. The nice thing about vectors is that since it's all just done with geometry and math within Dynamo, it's really, really quick and you can evaluate a lot of things very, very fast without really depending on any external engines to go through and do things. Um, but often we need to go through and do a more accurate analysis and get true values. And when we do that, we tend to work with uh, different sort of web services or other software services that may be installed on our machine. And the solar analysis node is one example of that. The solar analysis node goes through and computes, oh, insulation values for different surfaces based on sort of surfaces that you want to analyze, any shading surfaces that might be kind of blocking the sun on them a little bit, and returns things like either the cumulative insulation or the peak insulation or the average insulation over a period of time, and you feed all these values into it. What we're going to use that node to go through and actually consider like really how much uh, true solar energy is hitting a surface, and then try varying that surface and see how that value changes. So, if I come down here, the first thing we're going to look at is an example of just a little sloping roof. It's example 11.2, and here is basically what we're going to come after, or the way we're going to approach it. There's the solar analysis for Dynamo package, which most of you download and install on the machines. We're going to select the weather from a rover location. The weather is actually going to determine a lot of things. It's going to determine the sky conditions, as well as the latitude and longitude. But the weather service, it goes ahead and from that basically figures out like you know what's happening with the sun and the sky. Um, we then sort of select the surfaces that we want to analyze, any of the shading surfaces, and that can be multiple surfaces or a single surface. And sometimes when you're analyzing things, you don't consider shading surfaces. As you do, you'll see it has an impact on really you know insulation hitting most of the different surfaces. Then we set up something called a time study object. And we can do that two different ways, either explicitly setting a start and stop time, or just by using the Revit sun settings. So the sun settings are currently set up within there. Um, you put all those things together, and ultimately you're going to go through and compute some insulation values and choose whether you want the cumulative amount, so over the entire year or season, the average amount, or just the peak amount in any one time. And each of those numbers give you slightly different kinds of feedback depending on what you're trying to design for. But once we compute those, we're going to display those as some sort of colored surface. And then how we're going to do that is, in this example, we're just going to say, let's take the maximum value and then compute all the values as a percentage of that so we can sort of scale everything relative from like orange being the, the, the heaviest or yellow being the heaviest and everything scale relative to that. Okay, so that's basically the approach. So to, play with this, go ahead and open up example 11.2 if you can, in Revit. You can go ahead and close up this one. And you'll see at 11.2 we start out with sort of a very simple little field of buildings. And close that on out. Okay, so 11.2, let's pop back out there. I'm gonna use my little solar analysis sloping roof field of buildings. It actually has this little parametric form inside of there, which is a kind of a simple building with a shed roof that can slope. Let's just take a look at this. The idea here is I have a whole bunch of different surfaces here. I'll just get rid of that one. That one's not really doing anything. Here's the building of interest. It's that little sloping roof building in there. And in this roof, uh, we have some different parameters we can go through and change. We can change, for example, the roof base height if you want to make it higher up. Or we want to make it lower down to the ground. It was currently set at 40. You can change the building length, the building width, or the roof slopes, probably the most interesting thing here. 
The roof slope here, well actually that and the building, uh, the roof base height are both interesting. This is a 30 degree slope. If you said that on the other hand, you wanted to make it a 60 degree slope. Okay, just much slopier. We can also try rotating that building around a little bit too. But here's the idea is that surface that we're gonna go through and consider is partially shaded in that depending on how the sun is moving through the sky, there are different times when shadows are gonna be cast by this tall building over here in the upper left-hand corner, this shorter building in front, this taller building, there's two taller buildings over here on the right-hand side. So those different buildings are gonna shade at different times. And this is an example of why the insulation or the solar analysis is better than doing vectors. Vectors are really one point in time, a vector at that point in time. This will start to consider the impact of the sun moving through the sky at different sort of times of the day and also different times of the year because depending upon how high the sun is in the sky, depending on what time of year it is, um, the amount of shading that we get on that building will change. So it will actually be you know, kind of sort of a gradation of values there. It won't be a single value for the whole surface. Okay, so here's what we're after. I'm just going to lower that back down to 30 as our starting point. Go. So get the idea what we're up to? Excellent. Let's go ahead then and open up. Oh, it's probably 1B. Let's see what it is in Dynamo. And see if we can get our solar analysis node to work. My experience with a solar analysis node is that it's actually quite good at doing what it's supposed to be doing in terms of calculating the values. It's a little bit fussy, though, about the uh, whole notion of the time frame. So sometimes it needs a little bit of tweaking based on sort of the idea of the time study. Let's see if we can make it work. So I'll even zoom on in here, and let's just kind of take a look at this. Here's the note itself, solar radiation analysis. Hopefully it's in gray for you. That is the node. It actually came out of the package. Okay, and you see it has these different inputs. It has an input for weather, it has an input for the analysis of the shading surfaces, the time study. There's also some inputs for just a spacing. The spacing is if we're gonna put a grid of points on that surface to try to go through and do the analysis. Yeah. What's the desired spacing based on the size and shape? The actual spacing will deviate from, but never exceed this value. So this is kind of the maximum spacing between grid points. And right now I would set to every four feet. Okay. We also have a rotation if you just want to really quickly try just rotating the project around so that, oh, I think right now due south is down on the lower left hand side. We can try rotating it around and see you know, if that has an effect on kind of way the project should be oriented. Okay, but let's check out and pull in some of these different values. Now for the weather, that's just going to be based on the location in Revit. If you try just running this as a starting point, let's just go for that. It's going to fail because there's a lot of things that are sort of missing right now. But it has a location, actually currently located in Tampa, Arizona. I have a latitude and a longitude there. And based upon the weather server, we can basically figure out for that location, here's the closest uh, weather file. Okay, so we can go ahead and do it based on location. We can pull in another weather file. We can try different weather files if we want to. But that's going to be the weather. So let's go ahead and drag that in. So I'm going to say weather. Take it on over. Next up, we have the whole idea of surfaces to analyze. So we have the analysis surfaces that we want to consider, then we have the shading surfaces. And for my purpose, I just am going to choose a single face as the analysis surface, but I could choose multiple different faces. Okay. So for that, what I'm going to do is choose just that surface right there, that sloping face. Again, if you choose multiple, it'll just be uh, more faces to worry about. Next up, we have shading surfaces. And you'll see right now, I already have, looks like, six surfaces selected. It looks like I'm just, like, I'm selecting this 
these three buildings here, the top and the front surfaces of them, and we can select some more surfaces. Really select as many surfaces that you think are going to be meaningful to the analysis. Um, yeah. It's like uh, for the purpose of what's going on here, these will gather that sort of lower face, but I can say select some more surfaces and it says multiple up here and finish. What I can do is basically I'll choose this face. I want to get that top face. Actually, that face over there I think will be interesting. What else do I want to grab in here? That top face. That side face, I think that's good. How about, oh, maybe the top of this building over here and the top of that side face over there. Again, get as many faces as you want to consider. Yeah, it's just sort of the more you put in there, the more accurate the analysis is gonna be. I don't have that face or the side face over here selected because I think the top will sort of take care of what I need. But again, there's no harm in it. You go ahead and select some more faces. And when you're done selecting faces, just go ahead and finish. Okay, and you should get a list of the different faces that you've selected over here. What is finish window? Oh, top let's try this. Top. It's way up in the corner. Up the Revit top. It's right up oh, here. So what happened? That's hidden. That, like, it, it's really easy to miss that. And a lot of times I'll say, what happened to my mouse? It won't let me do something. And it's because that guy's grabbed it. Okay, so as you're done selecting faces, go ahead and finish, and you have a list of faces here. So we're pretty good now in terms of we can take the list of the surfaces to analyze and pull that in, so the analysis surfaces and the shading surfaces. I could pull that in too. I'm going to think about why I flattened that. I must add a reason to flatten that. Let's see if I can sort of see why. Because I, I just want a simple list of surfaces. Let me do a little watch on it and just sort of see what the purpose of that was. If I don't flatten it, let's see what happens. Ah, OK. If I don't flatten it, what it is, it's basically, it looks like a, it's like a list of surfaces within sublists. So I'm not sure that, it's by object. But Basically, it's a list of lists. So flattening it just basically services into a single list. So we'll take that over as our shading surfaces. So we're pretty good. We are almost ready to go. The time setup, though, is the one that is often, I think, the trickiest thing here, only because I think it's very finicky in terms of the way it works. You have the notion of there are some Revit sun settings. So the sun settings in Revit are currently, uh, if you come back over to Revit and you choose a little sun guy down here, and you say, let's take a look at the sun settings, you'll sort of see. We have some settings. Right now I'm set to a summer solar study, the location's tempo. That makes sense. Uh, the sun summer solar study goes from 621 to 921 from 10 to 4 right now. Okay, at one hour increments. I could change that to fall or spring or whatever I want or a whole year study. But whatever I go through and choose, I'm going to go for spring just to be different. Okay, those sun settings will be red. Okay, and then that will go through and Pull us, we can pull the start time and the end time and create a sun study between those. So let's just take a look at this real briefly because this is going to be the one that if anything gives you trouble with the solar settings, this will be it. Let me run this. So the start time is 10 a.m. The end time is June and 4 p.m. That looks pretty good. So I go to my solar time study, or time study from start time, end time, and that's going to just basically make a time study between those. This whole idea of using DST, that's a little confusing. That's sort of this whole notion of really whether you use to DST in the different time zones. You let it kind of take care of that. But what it does is sound really, really strange. Okay, we have the start time of 10, we have this end time of 
before, let me do this. Let me say time study start time, just so you can sort of see what actually comes out. Start date and time. And time study end date and time. So I'll pull a little out of my time study. And I'll run that. And watch what happens. That's interesting. It's going to continue to vex me all the time. 4 p.m., 16 o'clock. Use the location. I'm going to see if it's actually true. What I'm used to having happen here, and it doesn't look like it's happening today, is very often this will be reported back, but it'll be reported back into GMT time as opposed to our time. So when you see 4 p.m. in the afternoon, it'll actually be, oh, let's subtract eight hours from that. It'll be like eight in the morning or something like that. So watch out for that. It actually seems like it's getting the right thing, so I'm going to let that be. It's getting the location, that's all fine. Time study, USDSC. Okay, got it. I put these other two boxes down here, just date and time, just as an example that you can explicitly go through and put in the start time and end time. Okay. This is actually better though to go with the sun setting start time and sun setting end time. That should be more accurate. But I'll be honest, this is like if it's anything that sort of breaks in this analysis, it's in this time study, if when we run the analysis you get a bunch of zero values. Generally, what you need to do is just go back and tweak the time just a little bit to kind of goose it, okay, and then we'll get the right values. But if you're getting a bunch of zero values, it's usually just getting confused about the time because it's just not evaluating a, a, a valid period. Okay, so I'm going to take that time study and plug that in. Okay, and you are ready to roll, so if you want to, let her rip and let's see what happens. Okay, it's going to go off, do a little bit of analysis for us, but looks like it actually got something for me. So let's see what it's getting. There are three different things that sort of come out of the back end of this. Actually, four different things. This node returns a, if you think about breaking it into a grid, the first thing it returns is a list of the cumulative values. So across the entire spring season, the total cumulative value is 381, 413, and it starts dropping depending upon what point we are on the grid. There's the average which is 683, going down to 647, going down to 630, and the peak, which is all around 872. So of these different things, if you're trying to think about the total amount of energy you can collect on that surface throughout the spring season, cumulative is probably the best thing you want to be looking at. Okay. If you want to think about the worst case scenario for the hottest it could ever be up on there, if you want to sort of basically think about if I'm going to put in some glazing that's going to cut down on the amount of like uh, solar energy that comes through, if I want to sort of figure out what the peak value that I have to worry about, the peaks will go through and give you sort of the worst cases. And the average is just sort of overall, kind of considering the pluses and the minuses, really what it works out to on average for those different locations. Actually, so Jordan, if you look at these, if the value for the average is 683, can you tell what units that is? 683. It'd be like, it's, it must be, it's got to be like kilowatt hours per meter square. It's, it's, it's yeah. like kilowatt hours per square meters, but actually, I would guess it actually depends on what your units are in Revit. Mm. So, so it could be to, BTUs within. Yeah. So right now, I mean, if I go into the project units, 
Let's go. We'll do the same thing over here. So you think? Uh, you go to HVAC. If you look at what is it picking up? Solar. Solar radiance. That's not in there. Electrical. Oh, here it's under energy. It's under Lots energy. of feet. So I got BTUs right now. What do you got? Yeah, I got BTUs as well. Okay, so this might be BTUs. Yeah. But again, we gotta sort of figure out what, what this value is. So you have like the yeah. it's it it may or may not be normalized. It's it's hard to tell because it just depends on how big of a how big is the, the spacing. So we put in every four feet. Every four feet. Yeah. And that's in both directions, right? Yeah. So I think so you should be getting about, about 16, sixteen square, square feet. feet. Which is a little bit more than a square meter. Yeah. It's probably just BTUs then. Okay. No worries. So watch out for units. We have to sort of figure out what the right number of units are. But here's what we can do is based on those values, we can start to go through and think about a lot of things. You can see that, for example, for the calculation points, I'm counting the points of the 750 points. There's a lot of points on that route. Okay, 1,700 of them. But as I go through and take those points, I can link them together and actually start doing something. I can kind of colorize, I can do all sorts of different things. I can sort of compute the sum of all these, I can compute the average of all these, but I got a lot of data. But as a starting point, just check to make sure that you get some sort of values out. And if you're getting a bunch of zeros, almost you know, nine times out of 10, it's something to do with the time studies, just off and a little bit of tweaking to the time boundaries. So go through and change that. If in Reddit you have uh, like a short window of solar settings, so your like solar blanket's like kind of thin, yeah. and then you give it values outside of that, will it break it, or will it still just only be fed values between the solar study? I think it only. I think it's only going to go through and use the values. It's only going to sample up the values that were in that time for that time period. Okay. That would be my guess. Actually, let's try something just sort of real simple here. This is the peak for the spring and all that type stuff. Let's go ahead and just try, I'm going to change it to summer. Okay, so we think that would be probably more sun. Did you just left click? I don't see the sun anymore, so how do I change it to summer? Oh, um, come on down. Oh, the lower left again. Yep, yeah, yep, yep. there it is. Right. Sun settings. Say summer. Let's try running that. So as opposed to my 381. Now it's 369. That's interesting. Lower. Okay. Although that's at different points on the grid. I'm not sure if I'm at the lower or the higher point of the grid right now. Um, we'll have to look at it in terms of the colorization. We'll put the colorization on the middle. Because in terms of all these points, it's just a grid of points. If I'm down low or high, I don't know, it's, the values could be a little bit different based upon like, uh, where I'm sampling. So I got a bunch of data points kind of popping out here. So here's what we want to do with the data points. If I want to display them as a color range on the surface, here's what you can do. Oh, if I wanted to grab, for example, the cumulative points, so I want to get the cumulative insulation, I'll take that over, and what I want to do is I want to go through and actually just find the maximum item there and then just scale all the different items in the list, dividing it by the maximum item, so I can sort of get a scale of 0 to 1. So it'll go through and if you're close to it, you'll be 90%. If you're further away, you'll be 50%. But I'm going to take basically the list of items. I have to flatten it. The reason I have to flatten it is that it has the hierarchy right now because it's broken up into columns, rows and columns. So if I flatten that, let's go ahead and run this. See, here's just a big old flat list. I come over here and say the maximum item, the maximum item is 378. So what I'm going to do is just scale everything versus that 378,000. Basically just dividing every item, let me go ahead and divide every item in the list based on by the maximum. So if I do that, 
this should give me a whole bunch of values that are somewhere going from, oh, whatever the lowest percentage is, all the way up to like close to one. So that's all just scaling. So I'm going to flatten the list, I'm going to pick the highest item on the list, and then just basically divide every item by the highest. Great. Now, if we have all of that with those values, we can go through and map them to some colors. We have the idea here, this is that same color range function, although what we define is three different little sub-variables. We define something called blue as a variable, which is a color, orange and red, which are different colors. Then for the list of colors, we made blue, red, orange, and then the indices are 0, 0 0.51. So Anything that gets a value of zero will map to close to blue. Anything at 0.5 will be close to orange. Anything close to one will be close to red. So it's just kind of, that's a very compact way of doing the color range. So if you take all those and plug in those values, okay, we're in pretty good shape. I can watch that. Let me go ahead and run that. You'll see, this is just going to return a whole bunch of blue-red values, blue, red, yellow. And if I now want to map that to the surface, what I'll do is I'll take those values, and I have to go way back over here and get the surfaces. based on the index. So the first one in the list is blue. So that's going to get mapped to the values close to zero. Orange is going to map to close to uh, zero point, or orange is actually, I take that back. Orange is the top of the range. It's mapped close to one. Red is in the middle of the range. It's close to 0.5. But each of these different colors, they have three different values, RGB and alpha. So actually, this is kind of funny. If I look at this, this is not right. It should be that the blue is the, I'm getting no blue in this. I am pretty certain that should have the 255 in there too. Yeah, the first one's alpha, right? Yeah. Not that it makes a difference, because there's, there's so little blue going on in there. But so. What's at RGB, so 255 is blue, orange is red and green, okay, and red purely is, yeah, so that should actually be 255 right there. Okay. But at least for this one, there's not that much variation across the surface. So if you go popping around down in there, let me zoom on in, orbit this around. There's a little variation around the corners, but nothing too awfully big. Yeah, it's nice to be just doing uh, one of the walls because it shows you the blue to make sure it's working. I'll say it again. I said it's nice if you select multiple surfaces. Oh, as the analysis the, surface? Yeah, select the wall as well just to make sure that it's working. So it's it as well. Sure, let's check that out. Okay, so if we did that. So in terms of the surfaces to analyze, let's go and do that. So this is where right now I have a single surface, so I have to say select faces again to get yeah. multiple? Yep. Okay, let's try this. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to replace my analyze with a couple different surfaces. Can you just do shift and do two, like we selected two shading surfaces? Actually, in this case, well, because select face only wants one, that's okay. the only reason yeah, I need. Yeah, because I'm trying it in this one. Yeah. So let's see about this. I'm going to change, come back over here. Let me get rid of some of these surfaces. It's interesting, if I have them already selected, how do I get rid of them? 
that's plusing it. Now it says it's minusing it. Actually, let's do that. I'll just add it in there. I'll add that one to it. Oops. Okay, now change. I'll get that wall surface. I'll get that wall surface. I'll get that wall surface. Try finishing that. And I got the four surfaces. Okay. I think I'm going to have to flatten it again, just in the same spirit as the other one. Yeah, what I'm really trying to do is, oh, uh, what is it? For the analysis, yeah, I just want a, like, a, a small list. There's three surfaces right there, and flatten just sort of says it's like three surfaces. If I watch this, it actually, it's a list within a list. So it's, it's got just too many levels of hierarchy. So pulling that out, although here, even this, hang on, I think I've got to take this list of surfaces over here, because my colorization is not right and map them over here. Let's try that. No, now it's mapping it on there. I gotta do something to sort of play with the hierarchy to get it to map out right. Because I fed it a number of different surfaces. I got a bunch of colors over here. Actually, I gotta rethink my logic a little bit in terms of doing this because really what's gonna happen now is I'm flattening it from the highest to the lowest of the whole thing, so. Yeah. Watch out for what I just done in terms of trying to do it to multiple surfaces right now. I think it's a little mucky. You gotta sort of look at just what's happening now is the results are coming back as a series of different surfaces. So even here. There's three different lists for each of the different surfaces. So we almost have to sort of pull them off one at a time and map them to the different surfaces. Because right now I'm trying to map it across all three of the surfaces. So again, don't worry about that too much in terms of what's going on there. I'll clean up that example in terms of doing these multiple surfaces. So basically, I fed it three surfaces, so I have three sets of results. So what I really want to do is get each result and map it to each surface individually, as opposed to right now. It's a little messed up in terms of what's going on. But let's just pause for a second and kind of think about what this is all about. At some level, we have like this kind of fantastic looking uh, uh, node that actually does a pretty good job of going through and computing all this stuff. That's actually been pretty good. It looks like if we feed it the right surfaces, we can actually get good values out there. Now, in terms of the results that are coming out, okay, it's currently a whole bunch of different little independent values. So what you want to start thinking about is really, if you have a whole bunch of independent values at all these different grid points, what you would say about the overall surface? So for example, if I was going to go through and say, okay, given this slopey roof over here, really, what is the optimal slope of the roof for this specific location? Okay. I can go through and try to vary different roof slopes right here and get those values back, but what number would I use to go through and consider the strength of each different possibility? So, you know, all these different numbers, if I look at it for 30%, and I look at it for 35, and 40, and 45 degrees, all those different angles, yeah. 
what sort of number do you think would be a good number to use as an evaluation? Because that's what we have to really sort of figure out. You mean like this which number coming out of solar analysis got analyzed? Yes. Wouldn't it be average? Well, the average will be, well, it could be. Because average is or just going to be, cum or cumulative is just going to be average times time or so, right? Or times area. Well, it's, it's interesting because it's, it really depends, again, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to figure out the total amount of energy you're collecting, yeah, then cumulative will go through and it'll sum it all up. Average sort of, sort of has, it has the effect of, it, it averages the positive and the negative times together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or the, the better or the worse times together. But really what we want to do is try to figure out how to take these numbers and come up with a signal evaluation. Right now, they're really a whole bunch of individual numbers. So what we want to actually start thinking about doing is how we can bring all these individual numbers together to kind of create some overall kind of evaluation. And that could be either summing up all these different numbers or averaging those numbers. But it's interesting because you could have the you know, average cumulative value, you have the total of the average, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. And it's really just trying to figure out what is the best way to go through and, you know, come up with a number that you want to use. So for example, let me sort of start this out again in terms of, I'll just put it back to the single surface. Again, just to kind of simplify that. There's all kinds of hierarchy of things about things. Oh, it is. And you think it's it's probably area and temp temporally as well. It's kind of both. So you have the different surfaces, and then you have like you're breaking up the values. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of thinking about an overall value, let's go back over here and kind of take a look at this. I have all these different values. This is just for a single surface right now. Generally, if I flatten all the values, the good thing is then I don't have, it takes out the hierarchy, I have all the values on a single list there. But at this point, if I went through and said, I could say that, oh, what is it? Hang on, math.average. If I do the average of the flattened list, Okay. That'll give me the average value of all those, which is different than the average you know, insulation. It's just the average of the cumulatives. If I could do sum, that'll just add them all up. Doesn't the analysis tell us this, though? Why doesn't the cumulative already give us the sum? What it does is it's giving us the sum temporally, but not spatially. Okay, maybe that's the best way to go think about it. Okay. Yeah, so it's giving us cumulative across okay. all the periods of time, okay, but it's still keeping all the different isolated the points okay. separate. So summing them would give us the sum both temporally and spatially. Mm -hmm. Average is giving you the average value across time, and then again, whether we want to sort of get the average of across time or the average across space. Yeah, these all just sort of give you slightly different values. So the problem is really trying to figure out which value you want to use okay. in terms of that. So like if I was trying to figure out overall how much sun I can collect on the entire surface, I would probably go cumulative and it would be the sum of all that and say that that's the total amount of sun that's available across the whole surface. And the, and the, the points, the calculation points, that's like the number of squares, the rectangles yes. that it uses? Yes, that's how many grid points it used. Okay. So even in terms of that, you know, if you were wondering yeah, and trying to figure out like per area or something like that. Or actually, you can figure out the area of the surface and divide it through. Divide by that, yeah. Do something like that. Well, that's cool. So we play games like this. And where we're going to go next time together is we will say, great, given that we have an evaluation function to do this, we're going to go through and set up a node that does this for us. And then try just feeding in different inputs, different inputs for rotations or inputs for uh, uh, degrees of slope on the uh, roof, and then get all these different values that we can ultimately say for every input, here's what that valuation is, and then try to figure out really what is the best valuation comparing those two different things. Okay, and that's where we're going to the input assignment. So 
This is marching steadily in that direction. Here we now have the, the uh, function to go to get those values. And now it's a matter of trying to just put that list map together, which is just a looping mechanism to test a bunch of different values. Okay. If you want to look ahead, oh, what is it? It's uh, the next example, 11.3 or something like that actually has that in it in terms of if you follow that one through. But we'll do it together next time. Okay, let us adjourn for today.